Welcome to a pastor and a philosopher walk into a bar, where we say the things you wish your pastor or your philosophy professor had said to you about God, spirituality, and the church. Well, welcome, friends, to another episode of a pastor and a philosopher walk into a bar. Today, we are going to be speaking to a great friend of mine who is a, was a pastor. I see her still as a pastor a colleague of mine, close friend, and a professional counselor, a therapist. I think you're going to find no matter how you've experienced this year with all the trauma involved and all the chaos, all the, all the things, this episode is going to hit you in some way, shape, or form at some point. I guarantee you, just listen long enough, and what Jenny brings is going to resonate with your story. So I'm excited about it. But first, before we get to Jenny, Kyle, we need to hear about what we're drinking today, because we obviously are in this proverbial bar. So what are we drinking today, Kyle? Today, I have for you guys a fruited ale from New Glarus Brewing Company. Uh, this one is one of a line of fruited ales that they do. This one is the most hyped, most sought after uh, of their fruited ales. This one's strawberry rhubarb. Uh, which is a very Wisconsin thing. I'm from Kentucky. I had no idea mm-hmm. what rhubarb was before I moved to Wisconsin. Is that but right? But like every Wisconsin grandmother makes strawberry rhubarb pie, I found out. And it's a, delicious. It's incredible. Uh, so somehow New Glarus has figured out how to bottle that flavor, and that's what we're drinking here. New Glarus, wow. interestingly, they only distribute in Wisconsin. So their beer is widely and easily available everywhere in Wisconsin, but nowhere outside of Wisconsin. So everybody that, that comes right? to visit wants this. So they make Spotted Cow, if you're familiar with that. Everybody outside of Wisconsin loves Spotted Cow. Uh, but this is my favorite New Glarus brew. Another reason to come to visit Wisconsin. Yeah, it's like it's the color of cranberry juice. I think it's a close. It's yep. a deep red. Mm-hmm. Yep, it really like is. You almost have to hold it to the light to see through yep. it. So Kyle, in my limited co-drinking experience with you, it seems you have a propensity to fruity beers. Is that definitely. is that true, or is this just coincidence? No, okay. that's definitely true, especially in the summertime. So we're we're launching this podcast in the summertime, and that's why we're drinking all this heavily fruited stuff. When it gets colder, we're going to see a lot more uh, traditional ales and stouts and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, cheers. Wow. Mm-hmm. That's good. The strawberry definitely hits first. Yep. Strawberry. It's mm-hmm. a strawberry rhubarb. For me, it's, it's like, it's got that bright effervescence, which I really like. Um, it's got the tartness right away. Mm-hmm. But on the back of my tongue, I get this, am I crazy? Or do I get this Barney, almost like, not Barney the, the purple dinosaur, but Barn-like <laughs> flavors. And then almost almost like stinky cheese on the back of my tongue. Did anyone uh, else the, get that? It's probably the rhubarb, <laughs> isn't it? Like It's kind of got that pungent, uh, or bitter flavor. Is it not that? Yeah, That's, I think bitter is right. Yep. It, yeah, it's it mm-hmm. balances really well. Yeah, it's like a f- you're eating fruit in a barn that has hay <laughs> and some funk in it. Yeah, in rural <laughs> and I mean Wisconsin, that in the best losing my possible. appetite. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. You're basically describing their their brewery setting. Like if if you go visit them, that that's what mm-hmm. you're gonna see. <laughs> the nearest yeah. thing is a barn <laughs> in the field adjacent to their brewery. <laughs> this tastes like New Glarus. Awesome. Amazing. So you said this is sought after. This I'm assuming like is only released once a year. Once, maybe twice a year, I think something like that. Uh, but you could, they don't announce it. Maybe on their Instagram, they might put up a post as it's coming out. So you have to look for it and then know where to find it and kind of get a little bit lucky. Nice. Right on, well, thanks for one. sharing. Yeah, thanks for bringing it. Strawberry rhubarb. Highly recommended. Cheers. So our guest today is Jenny Heckman. Uh, Jenny used to be a pastor at Bruce City Church alongside Randy and I. Uh, so she was my pastor for several years. Uh, and now she is in full-time uh, therapy or therapist. What, what's the official title there? What, what, you got a lot of letters behind your name. So <laughs> how, do you, how do you describe yourself? But the official title is a licensed professional counselor. Okay. So do psychotherapy with individuals, families, couples. Great. Uh, and we wanted to have Jenny on the podcast, uh, mostly because we're in this really weird time with COVID-19 and a bunch of other stuff going on in our country. And there's a great deal of anxiety. Uh, and sometimes that anxiety borders on outright panic. 
Uh, and Jenny is uh, especially suited to help us figure out how to deal with that sort of thing. So we're really excited to have Jenny on the podcast today. Jenny, we like to ask our guests uh, what they're drinking, uh, since that's part of the theme of our podcast. So, so what are you drinking? I am drinking a lovely chilled Pinot Grigio. Very nice. Chilled yes. to uh, what, what? called time. Josh. Oh. I don't. I couldn't tell you the temperature. <laughs> I just know that it's nice and chill. My wife and I were. Uh, members of a wine club for a while, so we got kind of nerdy about it, and they say it should be around 50 degrees or so, but I don't know if that's real. <laughs> <laughs> of course you get I nerdy about it, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> yeah. So, Jenny, hello. Good to see you. Good to see you on the computer screen, that is, in this COVID time. Um, you can Something you can feel in our world that's been happening in our nation more and more and more, just growing upon itself exponentially, is this polarization, the divide in our country, ideologically, racially, gender, I mean, you just, you name it, and there's people are, it feels like people in our world are spinning apart further and further, almost like a physics experiment. And this COVID pandemic seems to have accentuated that and really even, you know, in a moment where maybe we could even see our our culture, our society come together a little bit more, we found it, I found it just spinning even more out of control and being even more polarized, being even more separated, isolated, bitter, you name it. As someone whose your job is to notice human behavior and to assess human behavior and patterns in human behavior. Now that's on an individual basis, more group basis, but as a collective, I'm sure you know, just because of who you are, I know that you you observe cultural movements and societal norms and how they're stretching and all that stuff. So what would you say from your pers professional perspective, what have, what have been some observations about what this pandemic is doing to our culture and society as a whole? I've told people from the beginning of this, and I would definitely still say this is um, congruent with where I'm at, that I still personally am learning a tremendous amount. Um, so I can, I can give you some observations, but really want to make it clear that these aren't any foregone, gone conclusions and, you know, holding loosely to hypotheses that I have about, about this. But as I was really reflecting on, on this question, the one thing that has become apparent to me from the beginning is that this pandemic has either been an invitation for people to be on an accelerated course of transformation. Mm -hmm. And it's been absolutely beautiful to watch. I've seen clients and families and couples get things figured out and reconciled in, in very salient and quite quick and profound ways. Mm -hmm. Almost like it's, it's had people have to evaluate quickly what's what's most important and, and how are we going to make this work. So that's a trend that I have seen from, from the beginning. On the opposite end of the continuum, I've also seen that this pandemic has given people um, the opportunity to choose a very, very different path, mm -hmm. dehumanizing, dehumanizing in the way they're treating their bodies during this time. Um, dehumanizing in the way they are treating family members, their spouses, and the way that they are interacting and treating their friends, extended family members, community members, and, and even as they're starting to develop, not starting to, but really reinforce narratives that they've held for a long time about the other, um, whether it's the other political party, race, so what's been really interesting to me is because normally I always like to see see a middle ground, but I have definitely seen it. People are falling into two different areas, and that's either an accelerated growth course of transformation or a very rapid decline towards more dehumanization. Hmm. Hmm. Now, when you as you observe this dehumanization, that's, I wasn't expecting that super interesting, yeah. but it makes a lot of sense as you talk your way through it. Why do you think this pandemic in particular is kind of the root for that dehumanization? What, 
do, have you have you connected those dots or is that still something you're there's some dots that are there's some dots that are being connected and i also really want to give credit where credit is due i have a, some wonderful mentors and guides of my own that i i reflect on these things as well um, and so much of this what i'm going to say comes out of some dialogue there but this is definitely something i've been reflecting a lot and in particular as it relates to those of us who live in the United States. And one of the conclusions that I've come to is that I think part of the reason, in particular for some of the just bad behavior and dehumanizing behavior that, that we're seeing, that I'm seeing, is that as Americans, we have an extremely dysfunctional belief about rights and, and freedom, hmm. that there are what I'm seeing is that we're, the people who are struggling the most to cope are people who believe that we should have unlimited rights, unlimited freedoms. And of course, you know, as, as people who are Christian in orientation, we know by design that freedom has limits because unlimited freedom, unlimited rights do not lead to human flourishing. But that, that so far is one of the dots that I'm connecting in particular in the United States that this has very much challenged the paradigm many Americans have about an entitlement to unlimited freedom, unlimited rights. Wow. So it's interesting that when you, you framed it as the people that are having the hardest time coping are the people mm -hmm. who view it that way. So it's uh, it's not just that they have an opinion that we disagree with. It's actually having psychological effects that are making their lives worse from their perspective. Is that right? Yes. And I, a colleague of mine asked me the other day, um, and we'll probably get to this a little bit later, but the, the types of issues that I'm seeing coming my way and dealing with, and I'm sure that I'm, that other therapists would, would share the same, the same thing. They're quite different. And so for people who have a, a really rigid paradigm about anything, could be a rigid paradigm about rights, about freedom, rigid paradigms about how things ought to be, how God should work, what should go my way. Their paradigms are way too constricted to be able to contain reality. And whenever our paradigms are too small and constricted to, to be able to deal with and hold reality, we will not function well. Hmm. Can you relate that, Jenny, to... Instantly, I go to religion and Christianity and faith journeys, and that just sounds so familiar. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm so glad to have your perspective, the perspective of someone who study, digs down deep into the human psyche and brain and emotions and all that stuff. This, this idea of someone being, having such a rigid worldview and theology and concept of who and what God is. That sounds like you're saying that's just fodder for a forest fire in your mm -hmm. faith journey. Well, in your, in your faith journey and in your psychological journey too. Okay. Can you mm -hmm. explain that? Mm hmm Yeah. And you know, I'm going to say some things that would are going to be, they might be shocking to some people. And, and I don't mean any, any disrespect to fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. I, I also believe that there are some things that we just can't stay silent on. So I'm going to give some specific examples that certainly won't breach any type of confidentiality because I'm hearing them so often. But for instance, one very rigid paradigm I'm hearing in my clients who embrace a, um, a more conservative Christian paradigm and viewpoint is, well, why do we need to follow the CDC's recommendation if every single one of our days are numbered? <laughs> it, it doesn't matter. If we're going to die, we're going to die. If my fellow, my neighbor down the street, if his days are numbered, what, what does it matter? Wow. That, that would be, that would be an example of that. Um, another one, another one that I'm hearing would be about the interpretation that God is punishing, God is punishing us for a specific sin or set of sins. And don't get me wrong. I think there's, there's some, amazing transformation that we all need in this, but that's so very different than keeping it in this tight paradigm that correlates God is doing A because of B. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, those would be, those would be the two big ones. And I'm sure I could come up with many more, 
but the, the big, I think the big thing overall is that somehow this is so horrible. We don't deserve this. This is hindering my freedom, messing up with my life. And somehow we got to hustle and scramble our way out of this. Mm-hmm. So that's another really narrow paradigm that just does not leave room for things that go awry. Yeah. Yeah. My 11 year old boy yesterday just made the statement that maybe, maybe COVID-19 is happening because of racism and God's punishing us. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I said, right. well, I, I like what you're thinking, because if God's going to punish us for anything, it'd be something like racism. But let's talk about how God works. So maybe that's, that's kind of an 11-year-old um, theological worldview. Mm-hmm. Now I said the offensive thing, so you can, I'll take the heat <laughs> off of you, Jenny. So I'm curious, before we leave this topic, what sorts of uh, specific psychological harms do you see associated with that kind of rigid belief structure, whether it's religious or not? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's such a good question. What I think where the psychological harm is, it's it's often, I mean, and don't get me wrong, that the person who holds the paradigm, most of the time, him or herself, that they, they are suffering internally because it's hard not to be able to deal with reality unless you live in a tight paradigm. But what I'm seeing more and more is that they're becoming extremely lonely people because nobody wants to be around them. People are losing trust. People are losing respect. They're in conflict with their kids, with their spouses, with family members, with members in the community. And so there's now going to be this, this loneliness as well. But, but in particular, when it comes to the paradigm of we should never suffer or God should be protecting us from these types of things, what I'm really seeing is people, one client said it best. She said, my ability to function has come to a grinding halt. Hmm. My ability to function has come to a grinding halt. When our paradigms are that narrow, we will not be able to flex and adapt and adjust to loss. Wow. Yep. I wonder how many people are identifying with that statement that your one of your clients just said right now. So, Jenny, when we think about anxiety, anxiety which leads to, is there on the on the continuum of you know as you're you're assessing um, and diagnosing anxiety, and then Kyle mentioned panic in the you know in the beginning of our time together. Where, how, how closely are those related? Is there stops along the way that, or is panic feed into anxiety the other way around? How do, how do those two things have a relationship with one another psychologically? Um, well, they're mainly, I mean, bo- both of those concepts, there's the, the panic is more physiological. Anxiety is a combination of both. But there, there actually is a distinction between anxiety and between panic. Anxiety runs along a long continuum. Panic does not run along a continuum at all. Panic is panic. It is felt intensely. It distorts reality. It sets people up to make bad decisions because it's based on distortions where anxiety on the continuum, there's a level of anxiety that we all need to function. There are higher levels of anxiety that will keep us physically depleted, mentally depleted, and a lot of physical symptoms as well. But that's not the same thing as as panic. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And how have you seen that in your practice in the last three, four months during the pandemic? How have you seen that kind of grow, I would assume, right? Yeah, well, it's interesting, Randy, because actually I, I've been reflecting on this a lot. What's been in some ways in, interesting and sort of humorous is that my clients who already c- came into this pandemic with diagnoses like OCD, generalized anxiety, panic disorder, they have fared very well. Hmm. And part of it is because they feel so normal. Everybody's <laughs> anxious. Um, for my clients who have OCD, they are so thrilled that people are washing their hands. Um, I mean, it tr- truly, I mean, it's been, I, I really would have expected something very different. So, but what I am seeing is actually a different kind of anxiety. Hmm. And we wouldn't necessarily term it anxiety. And if you, if I, if you don't mind me just taking, it's not going to be a sermon. I promise you that. But <laughs> there's, there's three things. There's really three things that have anxiety as features, but they're quite distinct and they're quite unique 
to the pandemic and, and situations like this. One is something that Dr. Pauline Boss, B-O-S-S, has identified as ambiguous loss. Hmm. And that is the trauma of loss without resolution. And that's exactly what every single one of us is, is facing right now. There's loss, but there is no resolution. We, we don't have a sense yet of, of where all this is going and what it's going to look like. And, um, and even by way of like some small, simple examples, you know, the other day I drove past Miller Park and there was just this pain in my gut of like, man, do I ever miss hanging out with my husband at Brewer Games? And do I ever Amen, feel sister. bad for my kids that they don't get to experience that? I mean, and I know this is like first world problems, but the reality is there are so many losses within the big loss, but there is not yet any resolution. And that for people, what the research is finding is that ambiguous loss without the definition is the, the thing that's impacting people the most. So it feels like anxiety, but it's a little bit different. The second thing that has come out in the research so far about the pandemic is a term that we call immobilization. And that's the sense that we're really limited and constricted right now, which which we are, not completely, but much mm-hmm. more than what mm-hmm. we're used to. We're without power to change many things, and people have the feeling of, of being trapped. And typically speaking, you know, I think the jury's still out whether or not this would fall right now into a category of trauma or pre-trauma, but the, it, it doesn't matter. People are experiencing the anxiety around immobilization. How, how do I live and move and find meaning and purpose and outlets in a, in a very constricted, limited environment? And then certainly people who've been impacted financially as well, where there isn't an end in sight, that would be another way that plays out. And then I'd say the final way as well how anxiety looks different is just the constant adaptation to changing conditions. You know, you guys have probably heard, I think people are so sick of the word unprecedented, (laughs) Um, but I think also we've heard the word pivoting a lot, but we're pivoting because we have to. Things are changing with this virus almost every 24 hours now. What we thought we knew about this virus at the beginning are different. And I think even six months down the road, but things are constantly adapting and changing and human beings aren't wired to have to flex and adapt and pivot that rapidly for this long of a time. We'll all do it and we'll all make it through, but it always comes at a cost. And I'm feeling that too. Wow. So it's just a different type of anxiety. How are you feeling that, Jenny? Well, I mean, number one, when this thing started, First of all, having to make decisions about how long do you stay in person and then adapting to telebehavioral health, which wasn't in and of itself difficult. But then what was difficult is navigating all the different platforms, figuring out what's HIPAA compliant, dealing with tech issues, every client, and then sitting in front of a screen where I also had to see myself Mm -hmm. and the client, you know, for seven, eight hours a day, five days a week. And then having to pivot back when it was time to start seeing critical patients and then pivoting again when therapists were required to have informed consents and, you know, liability issues and, and all those kinds of things. And now most likely going to have to pivot again as the numbers grow, as we head back into flu season. I mean, that's just a little snippet. And that's just on the professional end, on the personal end, with family, with kids, all that kind of thing. You know, it's that's there too. I'm sure Absolutely. you guys have all experienced that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the most intense for me is the difference in opinion about the pandemic, mm-hmm. about the importance of it, about the seriousness of it, about the reality, about masks, about, you know, all that stuff. That's, it's almost, it's like I'm experiencing whiplash on a daily basis, uh-huh. trying to hold and process so many people's opinions and you know, both as a pastor, then as a family member. And I mean, uncles, aunts, sisters, Mm. brothers-in-law, you know, all that stuff. It's a lot of holding. Oh, man. Mm -hmm. Holy cow. Yeah. So, Jenny, you mentioned trauma a few minutes ago. Do you think that COVID itself will cause an uptick in cases of PTSD, or is that a, a different kind of trauma? 
That's a good question. It, it's going to be dependent on the individual, as a lot of PTSD is. And by the way, just, just to make it really clear, when, when a person comes out of something like this with post-traumatic stress symptoms or disorder, that doesn't mean that they're weaker in character or even, you know, more fragile. It, it all depends. It all depends on what their circumstances were going into that and this and the specific impact as a result of it. So I, th- I think people are all going to be impacted, but not everyone is going to come, come out of this with like post-traumatic stress symptoms or, or a disorder. Mm-hmm. People will have a lot of reflecting to do. People will hopefully be reordering their lives. I think other people are going to, you know, become very, very rigid and um, tightly controlled. Everyone will be impacted, but not everyone will be traumatized. Mm-hmm. Yep. I wonder, you know, because PTSD is a, that's, that's a real and a strong thing. But I'm remembering from my journey, you guys all know, but f- for our listeners, I don't know, f- five, six years ago, I had a, what's called a traumatic brain injury and was on vacation with my wife in California and all of a sudden felt like my head was going to explode. And long story short, I had a subdural hematoma with a midline shift, which just meant my brain was bleeding and it shoved my brain over. There was enough blood that it moved my brain. So eventually after two weeks, I had a couple of holes drilled in my head, had brain surgery, was in California three weeks longer than I thought I would, and then came home and had a month recovery. And everybody would ask me after that for six months to a year, how are you doing? How's your health? And it was always fine. It, it got it got better. After surgery, I just felt like a real person again. It was great. But what wasn't fine was processing the trauma. I didn't know it at the time until I talked to you and to other friends who, who are professionals. And I remember you saying, Jenny, I, would, I came to you and I was like, this is what I'm doing. Every night after my family goes to bed, I will take a journey back to Southern California and I'll go to see the places that we went to and I'll go and I'll look at my texts throughout that whole time. I'll go on Sarah's phone and I'll look at my wife's texts during that time. I'll look at our Facebook feeds and watch how everybody was frantic and praying. And I just had to relive it over and over and over again for six to 12 months, really. And I remember you saying, you're having to fit that into your story now. And me and Sarah together had to do that. Mm -hmm. We we would relive it over and over again. I wonder two things. One, could you talk about that reality a little bit? Because I, I... I'm guessing that there's a lot of people who are listening who maybe are healthcare workers and are going to have to do that oh, same yeah. exact thing or who had COVID-19 and their world was was disrupted for months on end and they're still feeling the effects of it. And that processing and bringing that trauma into their person, can you just talk us ab- to us about that process, Jenny? Yes. The thing, the thing about trauma is that it, and I, I heard a lecturer, I cannot remember his name, it was at Marquette. Oh boy, maybe nine years ago. And what he said is that these trauma, it dislocates people Hmm. at almost level, every level of their personhood. How they view self, how they view the other, how they view the safety of the world, how they view their competency. You name it. I could go on and on. So yeah, the process is people have to be able, they have to be able to tell the story and go back and visit different pieces of it, make sense of it. But but then ultimately integrate it into their story that this actually happened to me. I think the thing that really messes with people is that, wow, this happened to me. Hmm. This is happening to me. This is happening to us. Mm -hmm. Um, This is not somewhere off in another continent. That's what people, I think, I think we've definitely adjusted for the most part that this is happening to us. We'll have some more adjustment to make, but yeah, being able to wrap our heads around this happened, here's how it impacted me, and here's how we made it through what was provided to us. Those are all necessary things to get the trauma resolved. In addition to that, immobilization, that term I mentioned earlier, is part and parcel of trauma or pre-traumatic things. And so one of the things we also know is that wherever we can empower people, to become mobile again in their emotions, moving their bodies, being able to connect in relationships, even in a, obviously in a socially distanced way. All those things to empower people is, is equally important as well. Wow. 
this episode, I think, is going to drive your your waiting list might grow, Jenny, and a lot of people are going to realize I need some I need some counseling. <laughs> well, I want to tell you, we are really great. I'm we're really blessed. There are so many good good therapists. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. lots of good people. Yeah. So, Jenny, I'm curious what you think about this. Um, it seems like, and maybe this is a difference in the way that the normal populace uses the word anxiety versus the way that therapists like yourself use the word, word anxiety. Mm-hmm. But I, I got into kind of a little uh, mini argument slash conversation with somebody on social media at the beginning of all of this. And I was suggesting that that there's a sense of appropriate anxiety. Um, I, I see a, a lot on social media of the sort of thing you were describing a little while ago where there are people who just aren't anxious enough about this, or at least that's the way that I would describe it. Uh, They don't take it seriously Mm -hmm. enough. They don't think it's much of a threat or they write it off because of uh, some kind of belief structure that explains it away for them. Um, So is there a sense of healthy anxiety? Is that a thing? Uh, Or would, would a therapist describe that differently? Oh, without a doubt. I, I don't know that I would use, I don't know that I would use the word anxiety. I think I would use fear. And what we know is that we do need to have, we need to have what I would call accurate fear. Fear that is actually congruent with the reality of a situation. Or we will get ourselves into danger and other people into danger. So there is a healthy sense of fear. Yeah. And, and anxiety. And I, I'd say more, if we want to use the, I, I, I use a phrase a lot, kind of a sober awareness that this is a real mm-hmm. deal, a mm-hmm. sober awareness that allows me to, allows us to be able to not just protect self, but really also protect the other. Mm-hmm. We need that. Now, I think what's getting really tricky for people, one of the reasons I'm finding people are not paying attention to the science. Okay. I mean, there's just some really good science out about COVID. The good science that I've read is not fear-based. It is a factual but sober awareness. Here's what we know right now about this virus. And if we do these things, we can mitigate the effects of this virus. What I'm finding is becoming very confusing for people is that, and I I wanna be careful here, I will not villainize the media and I am not villainizing any one politician, but because COVID is politicized, the media and politics use fear run amok to manipulate people. Mm-hmm. And so people are having a very difficult time often discerning what is sober awareness based on good science and what's real and true. And what is fear run amok used to manipulate and for someone else's gain. Mm-hmm. And so I'm finding that some people have completely tuned out science because they, they believe this is all a political maneuver. Mm-hmm. Yep. So Jenny, going off of that idea of sober awareness and then on the other side, fear run amok, I've heard it said, and I'm just interested in to hear your perspective, I've heard that negativity, fear, anger, all that stuff sticks to our to our consciousness, to our brains like like Velcro, right? And that good, beautiful, hopeful, wonderful things slide off like Teflon. That like you actually have to work to actually amplify and keep those good thoughts and things. I was just talking to my son this today. We were in the park and he talks he mentioned that he remembers so many of his bad dreams and very few of his good dreams. And I was one I was processing him with him that that yep, the bad stuff actually sticks a little bit more. Is that true? physiologically or talk me through that yeah it does seem that the brain appears to recall the bad and what didn't go well more than the good Mm -hmm. now i think there's some people by personality and wiring that they are just gifted in really being able to connect with the good so we being intentional about connecting with still what's good and untouched by bad is is very, very important. I'm also though, honestly, I'm, I myself in my own journey in this last year have really had to renegotiate 
my relationship with anger. Hmm. And I have so appreciated Richard Rohr's writing on anger that, that anger is actually, if, if we bring it into the presence of the gaze of Christ, hmm. that it is actually a pathway to something that is actually very pure and good. Anger is one of the most purifying emotions there are. Sometimes I think when we get concerned about anger, and I do as well, what we're really saying is we're, we're more concerned about contempt, and that's very different than anger. Um, anger tends to be quite pure and purifying. Contempt is something very, very different that tends to look down on other people, minimizes other people, demeans other people. But anger actually is a necessary emotion for coping and also for creating change. Mm -hmm. To go back to your original question, the reality is, yes, we do have to be a little more intentional about immersing ourselves in the good. Mm -hmm. Not just thinking about it, but tasting it, touching it, seeing it, being in it. You said earlier, connecting with the good. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. This seems super relevant to me because simultaneously with the whole COVID thing and all of the psychological stuff that's causing in the United States and kind of globally, we're going through this intense anger, rage over mm -hmm. white supremacy and racism and the fact that... Um, police officers can't seem to stop killing black people. Um, so I, th I think it's highly relevant to the situation we're in because we're mm -hmm. having all these issues compounded simultaneously and all these different emotions flowing through us about different things. There's actually a, there's a whole literature of uh, philosophy of race and various critical race theorists who talk a great deal about rage and, and anger as mm -hmm. a necessary tool for political change. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I've, as you as you talk, Kyle, I've got. Um, well, I'd be interested in your take on this, Jenny. I um, watching. Let's just take the George Floyd video for example, right? You could put a million names in there, but let's just take the George Floyd video. People's response to to that video has been fascinating to me, mm -hmm. um, and fascinating. I mean, I don't mean. Here's what I mean. It seems like adults are more the way they see that is through the filter of whatever their political ideology is, whatever their upbringing was, whatever, you know, feeling like there's so much of a filter when they're watching it that I almost don't trust it. What I trusted was watching my 13 year old girl be disrupted for two days after she, we allowed her to watch that video mm -hmm. and she couldn't stop. She was crying on and off for about a day and a half after she watched the video and the, the evil, the pure evil in it, was so jarring to her. She didn't have any of these filters. She didn't have any ideology stuffed upon her. She just watched a video where she saw somebody being murdered. And it was just a really easy call for her. Can you speak to this? these filters that, that distort reality as we're seeing real things happen in real time? Yeah. It goes right back to what I said about, about the meaning and purpose of narrow paradigms. If, if, I, if I can look at that video and interpret it through a lens of my political beliefs, then I don't have to grapple with the problem of evil. Mm -hmm. Don't have to get near to the trauma. I can protect myself from being disrupted. Hmm. So it's, there's a self-protection facet to it. Very much. And I'll tell you, I will never enable dehumanizing behavior. But I have come to the conclusion that most dehumanizing behavior started very, how can I put this? It started with a need to self-protect. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't make it any better. It doesn't, I'm not saying it's good. But with compassion, I will say that, that there's a path to dehumanizing behavior that often starts with somebody who internally is absolutely unable to have a roomy enough interior world hmm. to handle the whole of reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we okay. amputate it. Yep. Wow. Man. So Jenny, 2020, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's going to go down in the history books. Pretend that me, Kyle, Elliot, and all our listeners are sitting on your couch, your proverbial couch, and you're 
going to tell us how to get through a year like 2020, which obviously is going to have more chaos to it, even if we don't have anything new introduced, which I'd be shocked if that didn't happen. But mm -hmm. can you give us a little little therapy session on how to how to walk through a year, a time, a season of life like this that seems so chaotic and out of control? How do we hold all that? How do we how do we deal with it? Yeah, well, I, um, you know, before I was reminded of this last week, too, that before psychology and in particular the practice of counseling was ever a concept, ever a thing, there was something else that human beings have always had available to them. And, and I'm going to use the language of spiritual direction. And this is where I've been personally immersing myself in just in my own meditation, study, reflection. So bottom line is there's only one way we're going to get through it at really at the core. And that is going to be, we're either going to embrace a theology of sufficiency or we're going to live in a mindset of scarcity. Hmm. Unpack that for us a bit. Yeah, theology of sufficiency versus a mindset of scarcity. I, When all this began, I felt led to be stay almost this entire time in the Sermon on the Mount and doing study on it. And in particular, in Matthew 6, 25 through 34, about why do you worry about your life? Look at the birds of the air. Look at the lilies of the field. I, I really came, I came into an understanding through some helpful commentators where the, the commentator was basically saying, Jesus was not saying like, live in denial, live with your head in the clouds. Jesus was actually in a culture that was poor, the rich ruled, there, and there wasn't enough. And, and honestly, for many of the same reasons, we in our culture are experiencing scarcity as well, or certain populations are experiencing scarcity. So when Jesus was saying, look at the birds of the air and look at the lilies of the field, he's really saying, do not focus your attention on the scarcity that's caused by greed and anger and dehumanizing behavior. Focus on the provision of the Father, the sufficiency that's there in all conditions and all circumstances. That's where you're going to have your, that's where you're going to have your peace. Hmm. Okay. And then, um, so I think that, that is one of the biggest ones. The other thing, as I was watching bits and pieces of George Floyd's funeral, is the practice and concept of black joy. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw that. But what I would say, if you guys are sitting on my couch, the way to get through it is the Jesus way. And I would call that subversive coping, where we practice joy in the midst of evil, and we look at and trust sufficiency, and we're very careful about staying too attuned to the crazy messages about scarcity and about toilet paper, about cleaning supplies. I could go on and on and on, okay? Mm -hmm. But we live in what, what we're designed to live in, and that is in joy and in the trusting in, in sufficiency of, of God. And that may sound very overly simplistic, but I would say that is really at the core of easing that anxiety, the panic, that we know this does not have the final say, and we really shouldn't be surprised. This is the groaning of creation. Hmm. And I'm not minimizing what is going on, and I'm not saying we should put our head in the sand. However, if we don't immerse ourselves in what is still good, and still available is good, always has been, always will be, we will not come through this well. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's so good, Jenny. Subversive coping. That's my new term. I love it. Sounds like a book title. Coping. It sure How does. How about that? Oh, well, if you write a book with that title, I hope. I'm thinking you write you that book. You will write a, no, write a dedication <laughs> to me. Subversive coping. It's good. That's the yeah. only, that's the only, that's as far as I could ever get, by the way, with a book is the title. <laughs> Um, so I'm curious if, because you're a pastor or used to be a pastor in addition to being a therapist and you were just sort of leaning into a little bit of that just now. Um, so do you think as a Christian and as a former pastor, uh, is there any special advice for how Christians specifically might be able to do good in the world uh, during all of this and also stay psychologically healthy while doing it. Some of what you just said kind of 
uh, goes yes. into that a little bit. Um, but a lot of what you said is kind of universal to everybody. So I, let me re- reframe the question here. Is, does Christianity, in your view, offer anything specific and unique or different uh, for yes. the believer that you couldn't get as a secular person? Yes, and I, I'd i say two things. One is we we can walk with responsibility and sober awareness while still being free, you know, because we know because of Christ and his, his life, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension, all four of those are important. We know that the reign of Christ, the kingdom of God, is, is here, not in all of its fullness. And so we take seriously then what, what Paul says in, in Romans, that nothing can separate us from that reality. I mean, go through that list. Uh, nothing in heaven, on earth, above or below, things present, past, future, there, nothing in us, outside of us, can separate us from from that love and from that reality that the reign of Christ, the presence of Christ, the kingdom of Christ is here. So that's where we get grounded and anchored. But then the second thing is, I think so often, I do, I have to remind myself of this daily and be reminded of it, is that we are little Christs. Jesus was the one true human, and we are made in the image of God to be the people who carry not only the good news, but are reflective that, in fact, new creation is here. Mm-hmm. We're the carriers of hope. Um, and so the, the hope there is that we, we live out our, our, our human or our Christian vocation in the midst of a, pan- a pandemic. Mm-hmm. Yep. I love that. I, uh, the way I've been, the way I've framed that to Bruce City, to our congregation, your former congregation, Jenny, has been to say, this is, we are in the birth pains of new creation. That this reality is giving birth to another more beautiful full one called new creation, the kingdom of God in all its fullness and goodness. And birthing is painful Mm -hmm. and it's traumatic and it's Mm -hmm. incredibly difficult and gory and and, and messy. And it feels like that's what we're in right now. Um, Mm -hmm. And that's not to minimize anybody's experience during this, this crazy chaotic time, but birth pains of new creation helps me see it in a bigger way than the, just this particular moment, you know? Mm-hmm. So Jenny, this is now getting personal because I'll just tell you my, my experience with, with COVID, you know, I could tell you almost day by day that week when this hit, right? I was with a group of pastors on Wednesday and we were all kind of like, Hey, is this real? Are you guys doing anything? And yeah, we're not going to have people shake hands. You know, that was the extent of it. And, and I remember one of our elders was like, no hugging, get out of my face with that. You know, <laughs> it was at that point yet. That was Wednesday, Thursday, um, the Memphis Grizzly player test, Rodi Gobert tested positive for COVID and the NBA season was shut down. Then the next day, Friday was, you know, all yeah. of us were going crazy. I mean, it was just on a day by day basis. And I was just, as all of us were, I was just responding in moment by moment. You know, how do we, okay, we're, we're not going to meet. It's not only that we're not going to shake hands and hug on Sunday. We're not going to meet on Sunday. Mm-hmm. We're going to do this online. And now we got to pivot. What do we got to do? You know, mm-hmm. Elliot was part of so much of that. And I, w- I felt like I was rolling with the punches pretty well. I felt like I was not stressed or anxious about it. I felt like I was doing like just responding well in the moment, feeling good about it, not feeling, not staying up at night. But then I've told you about this in the past where I've had these, what you call psychosomatic pains, where at different points in the last three to five years, I'll get recurring tightness in my chest that freaks me out that I'm going to die soon, or a a pain in a cramp from my chest up to the base of my neck, Mm -hmm. to to my jaw. And that happens numerous times a day. And I don't tell anyone about it because I'm freaked out about it. I don't know what to do with it. And all of a sudden I'll tell someone like you or my spiritual director or whoever, and it starts going away slowly, but I had to deal with it for months because I didn't tell anybody. That started happening again to me. Mm-hmm. It, it was gone. I went on sabbatical last summer and went away. And all of a sudden, late March, early April, this pain in my in my chest going up to my neck started happening again. And I was just so dang pissed off. I was just like, I'm feeling good. I'm handling this well. Mm-hmm. Why is this happening? And I kept dealing with it, kept dealing with it until I told my spiritual director and then kind of went away. What 
I want to know about that process within me and people like me. Why did that happen? Why does it go away when you start talking about it? What's the deal with that? It's normal, normal and expected. There's a term that I think will be really helpful to you and to anybody else experiencing this. And, and I really can empathize with you. I mean, and by the way, anxiety and stress, we experience it in the body, probably even more so than we experience it in our emotions and our psyche. Hmm. It's, it's both places. We're embodied creatures, but anxiety is very physiological. But there's a term called, called allostatic load, A-L-L-O-S-T-A-T-I-C allostatic load, which means that there's a type of load that is so high for so long that the body adapts. So we always would think, oh, the body is very homeostatic. That's the way God made it. It'll get back to normal. What a wonderful thing. But what we know is that there are certain types of loads over periods of time that the body is actually not designed to ever adapt to because it would be maladaptive. And so At a certain time, the body will start sending off signals like tightness of chest, headaches, tensions, decreased immune system, you know, you name it. There's all kinds of things, aches and pains. Um, And that just is our body's way of saying, I've done this long enough and I need to get a little bit of of reprieve. And so the way that I, for myself and and for the people I work with, that I would say is we kind of have to make friends with that that we, we can say, this is a real gift, actually, that my body is giving me these signals. Hmm. And nothing to be alarmed here. There's This is what a body does. We know from research that if we can we can talk to ourselves that way, that the, the stress symptoms decrease. But honestly, the shame about them mm-hmm. is what really is messing with people. Mm-hmm. That somehow we should be above. Yep. The human experience or that Randy and I lead pastor of Bruce City who's leading people and can cope with things doesn't get these. We're all subject to the human experience, Mm -hmm. which is why embracing that, talking about it, and then doing things to really take care of our body, get margin is is real important. But I'm right there with you. Yep. I feel like you need to bill me after this episode. Mm -mm. All free. (laughs) Free for all of you. I mean, not all on the podcast. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yep. So Jenny, that's that's me in my process. Um, mm-hmm. Have you, has your anxiety levels personally, like what what has been your, you know, now if you were sitting down with someone and saying this has been my experience during this time, yeah. how would you describe that? Oh boy. I'm with you. Like at the beginning, I, I felt like I was handless like a trooper, mm-hmm. leading interns through it, you know, family through it, all that. But at the time, it felt like maybe one long snow day. Mm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But the more this went on, and after the first Safer at Home expired, and we went into another one, and now we're looking at these numbers that we're looking at, and, you know, even what just happened in Dane County today, and where we're probably going to be headed, and all those kinds of things. Over time, what I started to experience, it's just, it was, first of all, just plain weariness, like, the, the feeling like I am having trouble making decisions, even about my schedule, like even getting myself up out of bed. And it wasn't depression. It was just weariness. And then for me, because one of my core themes is the fear and the, the shame of not being competent, having to navigate liability issues. And I've never been a therapist. I've made a vow. I will always operate ethically. But I don't ever want to be driven by the fear of liability. Hmm. And right now, the fear of liability is a big deal Mm -hmm. um, for many, many people. And so that, I would say, for me, has been the thing that I've needed. I've gotten reestablished with my own therapist, spiritual director, who's really helped me navigate that. But I think that the fear of doing what's best and what's good, um, in particular for my clients and for my family, that's been a big one. And then quite honestly, just the heartache of, of watching my kids miss out on some really important rites of passage mm-hmm. during this season and that kind of that kind of thing. But yeah, I've had a lot of disrupted sleep too. But then this might be TMI and you guys can take it out. But I'm like, man, I'm like disrupted sleep. I'm sweating. I've got a rash. Then I found out, geez, I'm in menopause. That's what that is. <laughs> 
So I was just chalking it all up to the pandemic, man. <laughs> when I started I growing a beard and a mustache, I'm like, okay, I don't think this is stress related. I think this is something different. You're amazing. So, I mean, of all times to go through that for crying out loud. Seriously. <laughs> No one gets to complain about 2020 as much as you do, Jenny. Oh, gosh. For our, for our dear listeners, uh, Jenny Heckman is a woman who celebrated her 40th birthday, birthday by competing in an Ironman competition. And did you do a marathon for your 50th? I did the Ironman again for my 50th. Ironman again, Good that's Lord. right. I remember working with you when we were, you were training yeah. for that. What an animal. No more. Mm. No. Oh, we told our daughter about that this, today, actually, because I was talking about you. And she was like, she looked like I had just told her about some horrible torture that mm-hmm. that you just sub- subjected yourself to. Well, and that it is. Yeah. It's amazing. And in theory, it's a fantastic event. Yeah. We'll do a second episode with Jenny Heckman, the, the Iron Man athlete that nice. you are, about that experience. Well, Jenny, um, you know, Kyle mentioned that you were a pastor. I see you as still a pastor. And along with your expertise in the therapeutic world. But I wonder if you could, you know, fully step back into that pastor role and just speak a word of blessing over our listeners who have walked through a chaotic, crazy year and had to endure all sorts of things. Would you just finish our time together by just blessing, speaking a word of blessing over our listeners? I'd love to. And, you know, you actually, you didn't know, but you gave me a real gift of validation because... When I talked with my therapist slash spiritual director last week and told her how ungrounded I felt as a professional, what she brought me back to is, Jenny, I think it would be much more congruent. And this is a woman who is skilled. She is she's older than I am, more experienced, and one of the most professional people I've ever met. And she said, I think it would be so much better for you to envision the work that you do that you are a pastor mm-hmm. disguised as a therapist. That's right. Cleverly that's disguised right. as a therapist, like to bring those two things together. So I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for that. It's true. Yep. Yeah. So I think the, the blessing would be that by the empowering grace of the Lord Jesus, the Heavenly Father, and the Holy Spirit, may you make room, expand your paradigm to let all that is good and all that is not good coexist. And trust that what is truly joyous, truly good, truly available and sufficient in new creation and the reign of Christ will never be snuffed out by what's not good. And may you embrace your unbelievable vocation as a human being modeled after the one true human Jesus to carry out his work, his joy, his goodness, his hope among all the people and places you find yourself in during the pandemic and beyond. Amen. Yes. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen, Jenny. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It was a joy. So fun. I'm not crying. You're crying. (laughs) Well, we hope it was as helpful for you as it was for us to talk through these things, to focus in on the anxiety, the mental health realities, and to find a center and some health in the middle of what's a really stressful year. If there was something in this episode that hit home for you, or if there's someone on your mind who this would be really helpful for, please share the episode, put it on social media, text it to a friend, whatever it takes to make it so that this important message uh, can be shared and, and experienced by many. Don't forget to like us on Facebook, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts so you'll be on top of all future episodes. We're looking forward to spending more time with you. Thanks for joining us.